Hey, welcome back. And this is to Chris Fire. Like I did mention before we went on that break, we'll be taking a look at education. And for me, the issue of education is really it's it's one issue that I mean we can really cannot you know have enough time to talk about. So we'll be focusing on Nigeria's epileptic basic and secondary education, meaning the primary and the secondary education system. Do you think the government should declare a state of emergency? Well, joining me on the discussion today to my near right is Rhoda Odibo. She is an education consultant at the Learning Craft, an education trainer, a curriculum theorist, an inclusive education adapter, and also an advocate for inclusive education. Oh my goodness, your resume is beautiful. Thank you for joining us on the Thank program. Thank you, Shoma. Thank you. And also to my far right is Mr. Joseph Aishida. Aishida, yes, you got Aishida. that. Aishida, okay. <laughs> Mr. Joseph Aishida, he is a veteran educator, the CEO of the Orientation Project, an education and school policy expert. I mean, who else can we have to discuss this other than this? Two beautiful guests. Thank you so much for joining me on the program. Thanks for having Thank us. Thank you. Now, before we go into some of the 99 problems mm -hmm. you know, surrounding mm -hmm. Nigeria's educational sector, mm -hmm. I mean, need to get your thoughts, your perspective on the happenings in Libya. Now, Libya, according to a lot of a lot of Nigerians, is a failed state at the moment. Ever since you know the detrimental, if I can use that word, of the former leader of of Libya. Maman Gaddafi. Mm -hmm. Now, there has been a lot of issues, and thanks to the CNN revelation, you know, the shocking video which has been trending on social media also, which showed how human beings were sold as slaves. Mm -hmm. I mean, for even as low as $400. And the investigation also, a lot of Nigerians who saw those videos were able to pinpoint, based on how this individual sounded, this most likely will be a Nigerian. Mm -hmm. And then, it's really shocking, it's alarming, it's Words really cannot qualify, you know, how shocking that is. But mm -hmm. then, something has been bothering me. Now, oh, before CNN got that video out, there has been months on ending, you know, Nigerians have been deported from Libya. Now, people are mm -hmm. asking, could it be that the Nigerian government, throughout all those times, never debriefed these individuals, didn't they speak with them, didn't they get any information on what was happening in Libya? Why did it take the video from the CNN for the whole world to rise? Wow. <laughs> Your thoughts? You know, even before I answer that, what's even very worrying to me is the fact that these people really don't want to be deported because many, mm. many of them sold everything they have mm. to find themselves to a greener, pasture and they don't even want to come back because they are coming back to nothing you know and but then it gets back to your question in that the government really does not give us enough information and i guess it's because they don't also go after the right information or they are not generally um, concerned about this kind this aspect of our life and you know, security and of course the way um, you react to the this kinds of governance mm. a lot of people are it took the CNN crew to go into what we call investigative journalism. Mm -hmm. And then that's where we were thinking, what are we financing? Is it really um, a problem for the general, for Nigerian people? Should we, why are they even going? Why, why are Nigerians leaving? I think it comes back to the crux of the matter, which is that the country is not working for a lot more Nigerians. Mm -hmm. The country is not working for them. So everyone is looking out Figuring for somewhere to go. You know, and that's part of the problem. If yeah. if our if our government, our institutions are not built to be able to find problems where they are, then we would not know that they are there. Yeah. And that's the problem. We need to now look around and say, how do we fund knowing what our problems are? Yeah. Because when we Having know like them, a think tank. Have we, if we do what are our problems and what, how many sectors are they in, mm -hmm. so that we can begin to know how to solve them. To you know, they came back. Mm -hmm. Nobody asks questions. The same thing with the Chibok girls. Who is following after their story? There should be some kind of longitudinal research or action research that follows how they come out of the, the things that they've gone through mm. and what we can do to prevent that a reoccurrence. Re reoccurrence. Mm. Mr. Yes. Joseph. Yes, I think it's very, very true what uh, Rhoda has said in that there is a general problem that we need to begin to think about because it wasn't like this before. Uh, many, many years ago. Something must have happened that caused quite a few Nigerians to feel that, well, there was no future for them in our country any longer, and they had to set off to go somewhere else 
and go through certain inhumane conditions to get to wherever they were planning to get to. And even at that, when they get there, there's, there's no guarantee that they will have a life that is a lot better than what they were living like over here. Okay, but you see, things happened over the course of several years that caused a lot of Nigerians to feel that, well, there's no more hope, no future for, for them here in Nigeria. Mm. And therefore, you know, they always say Nigerians are very resilient. Okay, we could do whatever it takes to get to wherever we want to get to. And then they subject themselves to such conditions. But the problem really right now is that, okay, here we find ourselves with all these um, individuals um, haven't been uh, stopped from getting to where they were trying to get to, illegally probably. Mm -hmm. And so what should be done for them? You see, it, it shouldn't take um, a, a, a documentary by CNN for our government to realize that they need to wake up to their responsibilities. Mm -hmm. there, needs to, there needs to be people within the government circles that know about these things and go out there you see, there needs to be government officials, someone that is designated to actually go to Libya, find out exactly what is going on, what can be done, and then use government resources to bring them back to Nigeria, especially those that want to come back. Those that want to go further on, of course, there are laws within any country they're passing through that they would have to fulfill. Mm -hmm. And that is something that they would have to look at carefully. And if they can't fulfill those laws, then they would have to all be brought back to Nigeria. Okay? And I think that's really the best thing to do right now because it's causing a lot of heartbreak and it's, it's causing a lot of concern for a lot of people mm -hmm. all over the world, especially Nigeria. Heartbreak. Now, you mentioned heartbreak and concern for a lot of people around the world. I got to know a young lady, I mean, through a family friend, and then she was never you know, living in Lagos State. She used, well, as at that time, she used to live in Delta States. And according to her, because she actually came to Lagos because okay. they actually paid a certain woman uh -huh. to take them to Libya. Now, that was how I got to And this happened late last year. So they were planning towards the spirit to go to Libya. Mm -hmm. And then the first question I and my mom asked her, why are you going to Libya? Exactly. Number one, you barely completed your, you know, your secondary school. You don't even have a secondary school certificate. Mm -hmm. You don't have a skill set. What would you do, even if at all you find yourself in Europe? Yes. What would you do? What value do you have? And now you because we had to take time to explain to these young ladies that, look, this territory, there is so much care, there is so much issue. Based on some of the information you know, we had, it's a desert route. We yeah. tried to explain to her some of the inhumane conditions she will have to go through. At some point, bury herself in the sand to escape you know, some of the Libyan you know, patrol team. Mm -hmm. yes. Would you want to do that? Would you want to subject yourself to not ha going days without food, without water, which has also led to the death of a lot of people. Yeah. Exactly. But guess what she said? She was survive. She was still ready to she do was that. Survive. She was, and at some point we were skeptical if this was beyond the ordinary. Mm -hmm. Now, for a lot of individuals, they do not have the education, they do not have sufficient information, you know, at their fingertips on what they're going to face there. They mm -hmm. all exactly. believe any way they wait. Bad. Mm -hmm. Once they leave the country, heavens will open for mm -hmm. them, which mm -hmm. is not quite as it were. And yeah. then yeah. we're using this opportunity on Crossfire to call on all agencies of government, particularly the National Orientation Agency and the Ministry mm -hmm. of Information and Culture, to please sensitize and educate Nigerians. Yes, you may want to, it's a you know, fundamental right to move freely, but then of course you must also know what you're getting yourself into. Well, yeah. we hope we can dedicate a show to having yeah. to discuss all these issues, but then let's not take our eyes off the main focus, <laughs> education. Now, um, the issue of education is it's, it's unending. Hmm. A lot of issues, a lot of challenges, each day presents itself with new issues. Now. The Nigerian education sector for many has been blasted as one of the least developed and not yielding as much results in line with the United Nations goals for sustainable development. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you have a contrary opinion to that? No. <laughs> it's just factual. Yeah. This statement can be more real. And I think that, um, that it's probably worse than it's being pictured. Wow. You know, um, about four years ago, we said that we had about 10.5 million out of school children. We probably didn't do what we were supposed to do. We didn't match um, action with information and words. And, by, and now it has increased. Why did it increase? Because not much is done again to solve the problem. Yeah. Yeah, why are the children out of school? There are diff almost six different reasons why children uh, stay out of school. Some have to work, 
for their parents. Mm -hmm. Some Poverty line. are in school, mm -hmm. but they don't come to school. Mm -hmm. Some come to school, in the case of girls, but because of their monthly p uh, um, um, issues, mm -hmm. they tend not to come to school. Some are in displaced areas where the war um, against communal clashes. Communal and clashes. And then, there's so many reasons why. And there's research enough to tell us why. Yeah. Um, look, we're not doing we're not doing what we should what for we education. Should a lot is going down the drain. Do you have and a contrary time. opinion? <laughs> no, I, I think I, I, I share that opinion. In fact, I probably even go a lot further to say that um, education in Nigeria has been ignored for a very long time. Um, ignored in the manner of speaking whereby the attention needed, the attention that should be there for the development of the sector is just not there, regardless of who, whoever was the Minister of Education or Commissioner in, in states, and I'm talking about many years ago. Mm -hmm. So probably in the last seven, eight years or thereabouts, there has been that attention that is coming back towards education. Mm -hmm. But you see, there has been a lot of damage that has been done over the years. So and you think four years of governance is not sufficient to address it? Oh, no, no, no. It's definitely not sufficient to, to address it because there are so many factors that are involved. There has to be the, 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 the finances, and it has to be channeled through the right route. There has to be the individual, the human capital that is necessary. Then there has to be policies, mm. and there have to be policies that are driven uh, by individuals as well that causes a transformation within the educational sector. You see, we, we, we see transformation and we see development in some sectors of the, the, of the country today. I mean, you could talk about telecoms, you could even talk about um, electricity. Mm -hmm. It has been a bit epileptic, but there seems to be a roadmap and we seem to be going somewhere, mm -hmm. okay? But all of this came about because there was, I mean, the government dived in head, I mean, head first and feet into it and they made the policies, they created the, the situation, they created the, the capacity, they created the right environment and it took off. But for education, it hasn't been given the importance that it should be given until just about right now that people, that tech people's attention are turning towards it. But it will take a lot more than what is just being done now mm -hmm. for us to begin to see the fruits of it. Mm -hmm. And it's something that has to start right from the grassroots, mm -hmm. right from the grassroots. There certainly is a lot, there's certainly a lot of private schools doing a lot of good and are developing um, education uh, quite a bit and very, very well in their own different uh, spheres. But in order for our country to change, the public sector, public education has to have the rightful place that it, would, that, that, that it takes in order for there to be a transformation. Mm -hmm. Because if you cast your mind back some years, I mean, just before independence, those individuals that stood up for our country, mm -hmm. that decided to make sure that um, our country got gained independence, and that charted different courses for us to develop, mm -hmm. they had public education mm -hmm. in Nigeria. That's true. Several of them only went abroad, probably for their tertiary education or so. Mm -hmm. But they had, they, if you, the if you read their, 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 their material, you, you would see yeah. the way they thought. Mm -hmm. Okay? And yeah. it was very, very sound. And we have to have developed a lot further from there by now, but we haven't. No, I mean, I was hoping to ask this, quest, this question much later, but now you've taken it out of me. You <laughs> okay. talked about the issue of um, curriculum and in the public schools. Mm -hmm. Now, Uganda right mm -hmm. now is seems to be an ideal model and mm -hmm. an example a very beautiful example in africa mm -hmm. i mean so much so that private schools had to come to the government ask for a sit down to beg the government to look we know you're doing so much to help improve the public schools but we're also running out of business <laughs> but in nigeria the reverse is the case yes now you're asking for policy you're asking for curriculum you know enough to build the public sectors but now you look at some of the issues. I mean, funding is one of the problems. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. The curriculum is another. Mm -hmm. Security is another. Mm -hmm. Some yeah. religious indoctrination and, and all of that is another issue. Mm -hmm. But then on the aspect, you look at no will, no moral will. When mm -hmm. you look at private individuals within the circle of government also have private schools. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. Either their wife. Also, how do you expect them to carry out an act that will indirectly or directly affect their affect business. Them. I mean... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's I interesting. It's, very, it's a very sad situation. But I, I almost... Uh, I, heard some, I heard someone say that we must always walk our hope. Okay, so we will be hopeful, actually, because we, we, we know that we have to. That's what we have to have as our uh, default mindset going into solving... Uh, the problem. But then when you look into it and say, okay, we want to walk this hope, 
But then in walking the hope, we need strong, honest investments. Yeah. This is not funding or financing education alone. Mm -hmm. This is investments mm -hmm. in education, investment in infrastructure, investments in teacher development, yeah. investment in colleges of education, investment in driving the right brain and the brains into the and innovation into the system. Investment in curriculum development because that takes a whole lot of a long time. Mm -hmm. Now the curriculum that we're using now is completely faulty from my mm -hmm. own point of view, in that it is not tailored to reconstruct our society or our country. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, no. You, you got me on that point. Now, when you say it's not tailored to reconstruct our country, yes, this is 2017. Unfortunately, some kids in the you know in schools were still learning how to draw a butterfly. Mm -hmm. They had the thorax, the wings. <laughs> Meanwhile, children in Japan are learning, you know, things yeah. at the speed yeah. of light too. Mm -hmm. Are you yeah. talking in that yeah. direction in terms of making the curriculum more 2017 appropriate or just revising it? I mean, like I, I, we have, we've always done. No, no <laughs> not, not, nothing like we've always done. Um, I believe that where, if, you look, if you take a, a picture, a good picture of Nigeria, wherever you're looking from, where, whatever angle you're looking from, politics, education, religion, secur security infrastructure, you would see that we have problems, deep problems everywhere. And so because we have problems, our, our curriculum is supposed to help our students solve those problems. Yeah. Now, if our curriculum is a bit is alien to the real problems that they, ex that they encounter outside the school, then you be sure that they will not do, um, they will not be part of the people who will solve the, help solve the problem. For example, it's, it, 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 there's no reason why our secondary school students should not be going to have, have, for having opportunities of job shadowing yes. while they're in school. Mm. Because again, we have the problem of unemployment. Mm -hmm. So now what we do is to get into them and find out what areas of skill sets that they have so that we can now begin to look at future, the industries that will, they will fit in in their own future world of work. Mm. Reconstructing our society also means that we have to rethink. Corruption is a big deal. How do yeah. we solve corruption? We solve corruption, corruption by weaving it into our math world problems. Okay. Discussing it in, in our comprehension stories where students will actually look for facts and details. Yeah look for key problems, what's the main idea, how can, how can we support, what details will help us solve this problem. We also look at how social studies and civic education will mm. just totally discuss the issues that we're having so that our young children will begin to see them as wrong, first of all, and then see solutions right there mm -hmm. in, in, in the subject. So this is a real big area to touch on when it comes to education, but we need, we need to focus on one of the strongest <coughs> parts, which is, of course, investments in infrastructure, teacher development, mm -hmm. which directly affects colleges of education. Who are we recruiting into our schools? Guess what? Recently, JAM accepted that 100... The cut-off mark. Cut-off mark mm -hmm. for teachers coming into colleges of education. It was okay for you to score 100 out of 400. Now, 100, in, in the opinion of a lot of people, is outright failure. <laughs> yes. I don't know anywhere else it is not. <laughs> hmm. I don't know where 100 out of 400 constitutes a pass mark. I so in your opinion, the government is deliberately, if I can, we can all you know, be safe to assume that the government is deliberately killing the education system. If JAM accepts mm. that the cutoff mark for entry into any college of education is 100 out of 400, uh, I guess we can't really add much but to say that, well, we will get the least um, brain qualified. qualified into yes. the system because then anybody can come in. Hmm. So we have to be honest about that. Okay, so Mr. Joseph, um, yeah. Rita talked uh, something, you know, she made a beautiful point, especially as regards curriculum, having to teach the children, you know, issues of a civic responsibility, having to address and prefer solution to the problems of Nigeria. At what age, as an educator and, you know, an expert in, in that field, at what age should some of these um, informations be thrown at the children should it be from secondary school or from the university or from say stages four to six mm. at, at what stage would you recommend well i would certainly recommend it to be done from the primary school okay because and it has to be it, it has to be broken down in such a way that it's easy for the children to understand but at the same time we tend to make that mistake that the rate at, and manner in which we absorbed information when we were younger 
is the same way children are absorbing information right now. That's totally wrong. Yeah. There's so much more a child would know now at eight years old than I knew when I was eight years old. Mm, that's true. So we can't break it down in such that's a way true. that we feel, okay, well, this is okay for them. No, we have to do it in a way that it, it actually stretches their imagination because they themselves would always want to go, especially when the content is, is, is interested, they would want to go a lot, a lot further from what you just gave them. So the, it should be right from the primary school because you would see rich discussion and discourse happen among the children when, they when, when they're exposed to some of this information. And then they take us on tangents that we would not have thought of because they are thinking with the mind of a child about solutions that would help and assist them as they grow up. Mm -hmm. But we are thinking about solutions for just right now. We're not looking at it from their own perspective. Mm -hmm. And we have to begin to look at solutions from the perspective of the child. And that can only be done when we give the child the opportunity to, to, to interact with this information mm -hmm. and then bring forth solutions. Be expressive enough. Exactly, and be expressive enough mm -hmm. as well. Okay, there. On that note, we'll go on a quick break. And while we return, we'll take the discussions further. We'll be right back. This is to Chris Farr. Thank you for joining us. This is the Crespa. I am still Aga Inyeshima. Rhoda Odibo is sitting in the studio. And Joseph Aishida is, is still in the studio. Oh my goodness. I really must learn how to pronounce <laughs> your surname you get the before I leave the studio. Okay. The issue which happened a few weeks back in Kaduna State as regards the competency test taken, you know, written by some of the teachers, the public school teachers in Kaduna State. I mean, that dust hasn't died down mm -hmm. because a lot of Nigerians are still waiting to see what What's next, what up? step would the Kaduna State government take. And I was having this discussion with some colleagues at work, and in fact, I mean, the, the responses I got was really alarming and shocking. And then it made me ask myself if really as ordinary Nigerians, if we really are patriotic enough to want this country to work, if we're really ready to support government at all forms and levels, you know, on taking certain decisions mm -hmm. that will help shaping, you know, the, the future of you know, generations to come. But then, Joseph, what's your thought on the happenings in Kaduna State? Oh, wow. Well, um, I've had lots of thoughts on it. Okay. And um, one thing I'll, first, I'll certainly say is that it's about time that this um, issue about the competency of teachers was addressed. I know there have been pockets of attempts by different state governors in, in the past, okay? So uh, some couldn't follow through. And some couldn't follow through, definitely. But a situation like this, where um, the governor of Cardinal State has come out openly to say, this is what has happened, and even though some people are saying some papers were leaked or were not leaked, mm. at least we saw an example of the questions that were asked. We saw the kind of answers, and mm. it, it, it makes one shudder to think that, okay, you have adults teaching children certain things that they have no clue about at all, okay? So, of course, I was, I mean, I, I was quite um, interested in the fact that it, it, ha it has happened now. But then, you see, there's, there would certainly be a ripple effect because there has to be a situation whereby teachers are recruited mm -hmm. to take the place of those that were sacked. And then there has to be a situation whereby the process of recruiting these teachers does not bring about a, a situation whereby the same kinds of teachers that do not have the competency to teach will find their way will back. Find their way back. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it has to be a rigorous process. Okay, and even though it says that the numbers are many, but we, would, we mm -hmm. can't find the about teachers. About 21,000. Mm -hmm. Yes, we That's can't find the teachers. That we, It will surprise you mm -hmm. about the, the amount of people in this country that um, are passionate about education mm -hmm. and that just need to have a chance to mm -hmm. show that and have a lot of content in them. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I, I think it's a very, very laudable thing that has been done. But then th there's a lot more to be done because okay. when we look at the situation whereby the new teachers come in, now how is their, their, their professional development going to be maintained? Mm -hmm. You can't bring them in now and then nobody looks at how competent they are for the next 10 years. Mm -hmm. And then they end up still teaching in 10 years' time what they're teaching today, whereby right? children mm -hmm. have gone further than that. Mm -hmm. So those things have to be set in place yeah. fully. So that there's a proper plan that, 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 and a map that the, the, I mean, that the Kaduna State government has in place to ensure that there's a, 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 a development of um, a goal from what um, El Rufai wants to do. Mm. And I, I think it's very, I, I actually suggest many other states should okay. go the same route. Beautiful. Definitely. Yeah, I mean, 
There, there are background uh, issues around that competency test that was taken. Um, I did have time to reflect on or even more observe the questions themselves. Uh, mm. Because again, when you look inward and you're trying to say why did they, I, I'm trying to find out why they failed. Um, some people who have some information about the fact that a lot of them were not teachers who took those exams. Um, some rumor more around excuses. being ghost, mm -hmm. ghost workers coming to, you know, some people said some of the names of uh, were um, listed were of dead people. Mm -hmm. Okay, so there are background um, issues around the test itself, that's mm -hmm. on one side, and then the, the questioning itself, the, uh, the assessment questions and all of that. I, I had time to look at it because in my work as curriculum theorist, I, I deal with a lot of content. So I, look at, I looked at the content of the test and I asked myself, um, many of these teachers, are um, English doesn't serve as their first language. Sometimes they might have had issues with understanding the question in, even in itself. It will alarm you that you, why, if you're a teacher, you should understand English yeah. language, and which is the reason why the competency test was taken mm -hmm. to, re to weed out those kinds of teachers in the system. But then there were, there were teachers who couldn't construct you know, a, a normal sentence going if into you recall, that. Now, if you recall, sorry to cut you, if you recall, the, a certain minister in this administration at some firm he was speaking even advocated that some subject like mathematics in English language and, and the rest of this should be taught in Igbo language. Mm -hmm. Now, because when that statement broke, I mean, a lot of people raised eyebrows. How are you going to teach mathematics? How do you expect these students to compete at international level with their peers? But you see, what you just said now also raises a fundamental question, but then I, I hope you can just answer I, that alongside. Yeah, let me answer that quickly. Do the Chinese people learn in English language? No. no they don't. Do they speak English language? Yes, when yeah. they have to. Mm -hmm. Same with Japan. Same with Finland. But then they learn Same Mandarin and they then Mandarin. English alongside. Exactly. Mm -hmm. But they learn the primary language, mode of transmission or transference mm -hmm. of learning is in their yeah, own they local learn. language. Yeah. The reason is because what happens to you when you learn something in your language, your dominant language, mm -hmm. is that you get deeper meaning. There are some words I can't express sometimes better than in my own dialect or more in my own language. Mm -hmm. And so the advocacy towards using the mother tongue to teach is in the right direction in that what we hope to achieve is deep learning. Right? But then how do you expect those children because their, their brain becomes tuned to the fact that this certain, this means this in my local dialect, but then you, this is 2017, <coughs> in Nigeria now we, we're in the global village. I would explain. We, we're competing with the likes of Russia, mm -hmm. North Korea, America. And so explain. how do you expect them to compete? It's a good question. Um, you, you, because you learn your language doesn't mean that you cannot speak another language. Yeah. English becomes a very strong subject that students will have to learn, yeah. right? English is always there. It's always going to be there. Mind you, even if you wanted to teach, if you want to teach, say, for example, science, mm -hmm. biology, you would have to explain cells using the word cells. Mm -hmm. But you don't have to explain how cells work using the English, English language. But then the intonation it. may differ. When we speak, mm -hmm. speaking about intonation, you, I'm sure you must oh. have heard a lot of different kinds of people speak internationally from different parts of the world. Do you understand what they say? Have you listened to the Chinese people when they speak English? They sound Chinese, mm -hmm. but we understand them. Have you listened to the Indians when they speak English? Yeah. You understand them. It doesn't have to be. There's a basic method. When the English language, what we need to do is to make the English language curriculum very strong in that it is a subject that every, a language that every student has to learn, right? But if, when you get, when you want students to do well, Usually, the mode in which you ask questions is, is important. Is important in making them to do well. Yeah. So, again, it's not a call that, it, that comes from a, an unusual place. It's a call that's backed by research. Children can learn minimum of three learn and speak minimum of three languages fluently. Hmm. The idea is that the brain has a way of working itself in interpreting the languages in a better way. So the more they learn with their language, the more, the more they, they do well with English. Yeah. With English. Yes. Okay. Well, 
I mm -hmm. still haven't quite bought you know, into that. But then, now, according to the recent report by UNESCO, I mean, the report was titled Accountability in, in Education. Now, a portion of that report, if I can just quickly read that, calls on governments to design accountability mechanisms for schools and teachers that is supportive and avoid punitive measures, mechanisms rather, especially those based on narrow performance measures. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Also, allow for democratic participation, respect the media's mm -hmm. freedom to scrutinize education, and set up independent institutions to handle complaints, develop credible and efficient regulations with associated sanctions for all education providers, public, and make the right to education justiciable, which is not the case in 45% of countries in the world. Mm -hmm. Now, I looked at this report yesterday, and the first thing that came to mind was, does this indirectly criticize the actions of the Cardinal State Government? Hmm. Well. <laughs> Just that? <laughs> um, well, you see, it's, 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 it's hard to just give a straight off answer like that because there's the uniqueness of the situation we have in our country and then there's the uniqueness of the situation found in Kaduna right now. Okay. Which seems to be a model across mm. 36 states. Mm. I mean, oh, yeah. because mm -hmm. just, I think, um, during the term of the former governor of Edo State, State, Adam Sashomole, I mean, mm -hmm. if he had followed through, probably would have had some positive results in Edo State by now. Yes. Well, yes, yeah, yes, then yes, that's yes. what UNESCO is saying about mm -hmm. our accountability. Exactly. You know, but how about the punitive me mechanisms and measures in this case? <laughs> see, when you talk about punitive measures, um, the fact that he has given an opportunity for all the teachers that were sacked to do the tests again makes it, um, it being punitive absolute entirely because he's like, okay, you didn't pass it this time, you have the opportunity to dusting up your, your skills, I mean, to, to freshen up your skills and become better and then come back and do the exams. Now, anyone that looks at it as um, a situation whereby oh, he's just being uh, punitive by sacking them is not taking into consideration the fact that he has given an opportunity for as many as possible mm. to come back into the system by developing the necessary skills and the knowledge and the content to be able to deliver education as he wants it to be done in Cardinal State. The thing that's about, the, way I see. Yeah, the thing mm. about account accountability is that the fact that you're building systems, you know, that allow you to be able to narrow down what your problems are. Mm -hmm. And when you identify your problems, you want to go to the root and approve them as much as possible. But in this case, you're dealing with human capacity, right? Mm -hmm. And then with Cardinal State, when you're looking what, at what they did and the questions they did, he did broadcast the number of people that passed publicly, and then he also says, you guys are going to come back and come and do this test again, because that's a rule for test development. Mm -hmm. It's something mm -hmm. that you, you're supposed you to do. do. You should do a test we test, yeah. so that you know yeah. that, okay, your facts are clear, these people are not competent, we don't want them to teach. The punitive measures can be, you know, they say we should look for global solutions. That mm -hmm. is, looking from the glo uh, global uh, eye, but working it through and local eyes, local, yeah. you know. Again, the UNESCO will give us information because they do a lot of research and they tell us what the best they feel is the yes. best things that we can do. But then we have to now look within our own culture and systems and customs because when we use cultural solutions to solve problems, we have we get much more better with handling the things that all the issues that we have. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, we we just really need to figure out how best to get things done. How best. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. now let's also look at some of the problems with education as regards funding. Now, in okay. the 2018 appropriation bill, education has about 7.4%. I mean, out of 7.4 trillion of the, from the 2017 budget. Now, and this is lower to, I think, um, way lower than, you mm -hmm. know, what the United Nations um, proposal is. At least the United Nations proposed at least 26% mm -hmm. of the national budget. Now. There is a major problem in terms of budgeting for education mm -hmm. at the, you know, from the executive arm of government, talking about the federal government, but states also have a responsibility. Mm -hmm. And ideally, the local government also should have a responsibility when it oh, comes yes. to education. But well, we know the situation with the local government. So mm. do you see the states doing as much to improve on education? And is it just about um, funding? Because there is one major trend we have. Yes, monies are disbursed, but how utilized are they for the purpose? Because the first thing we see on 
the, on the broken down budget, it goes to recurring expenditure. Either they're buying cars or the mm -hmm. building salaries, yeah. gulps it all, yeah. and then very little percent goes into education research. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. this makes me wonder how exactly we intend to improve on <laughs> education. Mm -hmm. Of course, it's, 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 it's a big issue because um, <clears throat> once the funding is not, the necessary funding is, is not utilized in the right way, there's a problem. Then if you back up a little bit, if that funding is not even enough, according to what um, is recommended by UNESCO, there's a major problem. And I, I think the, the way we see it in our country, in Nigeria, is, is it still falls back to what I said earlier on. And that is that the, 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 the necessary attention and importance that should be given to education is not being given to education. And therefore, the government can feel that, oh, they've done a lot of good by actually even giving 7% <laughs> to education, uh, even though it's even less than one third mm, of what okay. UNESCO said. Okay, but then even with the 7%, we look at it and just like you mentioned, the money doesn't get to where it's, it's, it's supposed to get to. You f we find out it's be being diverted to, through different kinds of uh, loopholes here and there. And at the end of the day, the school system, the education system, and whatever is going on in the state just remains the same. Mm. So you see, there has to be a collective will and that collective will can actually even be developed by just individuals. Certain individuals stepping up to the plate and deciding this is the way education is going to be done in my state. And these are the people that are put in the position mm. and they will drive it. And but you see, for that to actually even happen, there has to be some partnership with the private sector. Because when you have the private sector involved, you have the technocrats, you have those that have the webinar, and a lot of them, especially the, the sincere ones, will not be charging some crazy kind of money to, in order to make education better in their state. They are willing to come into it, the whole thing, hands-on approach. And then you have the international body as well, looking at Nigeria yeah. and wanting to put in money in education as well. But they need sure. to see a system working and yeah. the, the will. Yeah. There is a lot of grant that comes in, you know, from different, and the state governments seek for grants, yes. and they do get support mm -hmm. as much as, because look, the truth is that the international organization or international communities are interested in what's happening in Nigeria. Yeah. It's, a, it's, a, it's a country that has massive potential. potential, and so there's huge interest here. So mm -hmm. if state governments reach out to, um, and they have been reaching out and they do receive grants, yeah. um, I think it was Sokoto State gov Government who, on getting their budget, did their own, and of course, continue to stay with um, um, the expected percentage of, for uh, that should be dedicated on their budgets to education. Yeah, to education. They do that. I think they even go a percent or so or more. Um, and they're really working very hard. Mm -hmm. You know, you can see the examples of what they're doing. Soon we'll, we'll probably hear more about that state and what gains they have yeah. been making. It's impressive what they're trying to do, and we believe that you know if they continue with in that line, that there will be so, so, there will be an example or a template mm -hmm. that people can work with. What that says is that even more money you invest in education, more results you will get. The truth is that seven percent that is, is if those monies are properly utilized. Yes, <laughs> that's yes. why the word is investment, not yeah. divestment. Not <laughs> okay, so yeah. when you when you when you what, what happens is with seven percent, of course, it's abysmal because we have deep problems in education. Yes. Yeah. Um, if, if you go to our rural areas, part of the reasons why we don't have students getting into the school is because it is far. School is far. And they have to walk long distance. Yes. And they, they, so we have to come up with things like mobile schools mm -hmm. where, so that we can, so we need to invest in innovative ideas yes. that will get our children educated. But mm -hmm. more, more, most importantly is the quality of the teachers. Yeah. who are going to teach them, yeah. mm -hmm. right? So we have to go, there's Teach for Nigeria, you know, for for, for like her, what's her name? Mm -hmm. There are many innovative ideas around the country as to how to solve it, but if funding and investment is critical to success. If we pay lip service, we will continue to pay lip service to education until we, we spend more money on it. Now, if they put 7%, but break 7% down, like you said, salaries, wages, oh, yeah. um, uh, equipment, vehicles, and you ask yourself, who, where is this money? Why is this money going to salaries? It's the same thing that's happening in other sectors. Don't think that it's just education. It's true. Healthcare and all those things. More monies are going to people living large, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? And that's where the issue is. We can't afford to, now you could leave that, but education is a problem. Now, when we talked about bringing, get, feeding our students, um, as, a, as a means to attracting Attract them to come into school. school. Yes, yes. People who are on the streets, 
will tell you that it's not working too. Because you don't just feed people. I, I believe if you want to really solve Nigeria's problem, you're not just going to feed the children, you're going to pay their mothers. Mm -hmm. yes. You're going to give them some money for them to That's you know, allow their children a, a to come proper social to security exactly. system. So yeah. what that means is that you will have to spend a lot of money. Uh -huh. And that money will be spent, or, and that, those institutions where this direction of flow of investment will come will have to be manned by people who are not politically yes, inclined exactly. and people who are professionals mm -hmm. we can't pay lip services it's people who are professionals people who are paid basically basic basic income basic normal salary where they will come and execute their tasks mm -hmm. people who regardless of the political inclinations of the Entering. current administration yes. Yes. will be left job. to do their work alone. Mm -hmm. If we don't do that, it's a root and branch approach. We have to get to the roots. We have to look at the branches. We have to see the leaves. How are they falling? What colors are they changing? We got to really go into all the areas and yeah. try to solve the problem. When we talk about mobile schools, we we'll talk about early childhood education mm -hmm. because that's the very first step. There's research that backs that a child who gets to school at the age, who has an opportunity to get to school at least at the age of four is most likely to finish high school. Early, also. That's the research mm. that backs that. Mm. So that means that because we have that to interest. invest in early childhood education. As we captured earlier. Mm. Yeah. But then in all of this, the biggest issue is the structure where we have to also fund teacher colleges of education. Exactly. And we have Strong to ones. look for, yes, TRC, and that is the Teachers Registration Council of Nigeria, has said that they would add one year internship after, you have give, after you've been offered your license as a teacher, because there's a new yes. thing about that. Now, that one-year internship, I, I, I had to ask myself again, one-year internship for teachers who have gone to the colleges of education, mm. is, could that be a solution to maybe the fact that they're not learning what they need to learn in while the college, they're in the colleges exactly. of education? No, we have I don't to get go. That. Our time is oh, quick. Okay. But in one, in one minute, well, less than a minute, I mean, I quickly want to ask now, beyond mm. funding also, you look at the political terrain. You have a governor, you have the president mm. and the commissioner all have their children schooling abroad. Ah. Now, we have a lot of pressure groups and unions you know, in the education system, but then nobody is speaking to say, Public servants must have the children educated in Nigeria, but we, the producer, say we have to go. <laughs> to enjoy more of these our Ogunge videos when you just watch, press this button to subscribe on top of our YouTube page. You go love her.